Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second seminar or webinar of the Central Korean Studies for this academic year and this term. So my name is Anders Carlson. I'm the chair of the center. And I will also act as the chair of today's seminar. Uh, we're very happy to have with us Dr. Sang Pil Jin, who currently is a, a teaching and research postdoctoral fellow in Korean studies at Edinburgh University. Uh, so welcome back, Dr. Jin. Uh, Dr. Jin has his both MA and, and PhD uh, here from, from SOAS, an MA in history, and then later PhD in Korean history. And he, he received his, his doctorate in 2016. And also then during his time uh, here at SOAS, he actually was a, a research fellow for the center for two years, uh, organizing what then would have been the typical seminars and doing other things for, for the center. And so uh, Dr. Jin is, is a specialist on the, the diplomatic history of East Asia in, in the late 19th, early 20th century, but then also the political situation in Korea at around that time. And his talk today is going to be based on his forthcoming book, is going to be published by the University of Hawaii Press uh, coming out sometime in July. And this would be uh, based on his PhD here from SOAS. And Dr. Jin will talk for about half an hour or so, and, and then there will be plenty of time for, for questions uh, afterwards. So please, if you could, uh, as the questions come to your mind, put the questions in the Q&A box. Try to avoid to put it in the chat box or please in the Q&A box. And then after the talk, we'll read those questions that have come into the Q&A box. And of course, continuously, you can put more questions and follow up questions into to that box. So uh, please, Dr. Jin, if you would like to start your talk. Thank you, Dr. Carlson. Uh, thank you, Dr. Carlson, for inviting me back at SOAS. I would also like to thank all the members of the Center of Korean Studies, especially Dr. Yeon Jae-hoon, Dr. Shada Holik, Dr. Grace Ko, and Dr. Owen Miller. I should note that my research fellowship was possible owing to both Dr. Carlson and Dr. Yeon's kindness to hire me for two years. And it was also thanks to the fellowship I was able to use the funding to work on um, this research. So thank you again. So as Dr. Carson just said, my presentation today focuses on Korean neutralization, which is based on my uh, PhD research that I completed at SOAS. So, the formal title of my upcoming book is Surviving Imperial Intrigues, Korea's Struggle for Neutrality Amid Empires from 1882 to 1907. And this book is the first major study on Korean neutralization, both in English and Western language. As you can see from the slide, there's a reason why I think Korean neutralization, although it is a historical event, can also have significant repercussions for those working on social science, such as international relations. This is because, although my research covers periods of the imperial tensions and significant geopolitical intrigues during the high time of imperialism, since I incorporate theories related to international relations, such as balance of power and neutralization, this is why I believe my research can not only offer some new insights, I hope, both for historians working on diplomatic history and imperial history, but also international relations scholars who may want to look at some historical case studies 
both to test and to improve upon their theories on international relations. And this is because for my own research and recent trends, one of the things that I found quite lacking in the field of international relations, especially in the West, is that this tendency to overlook useful case studies in East Asia. Many of them tend to be focused on Eurocentric examples. So I hope my modest attempt to retrace Korean neutralization can help those scholars working on international relations to look at my book and to reassess their insights on international relations as well. So you may wonder, because the timing is a bit distant from the late 19th to early 20th centuries, my book may not be relevant for contemporary times. However, as I will discuss later, there are reasons I think why study of Korean neutralization can still serve as important um, lesson for both for scholars and policymakers as well. So I'm sure many of you here are quite familiar with international relations theories, but just in case you are less familiar or you already know, but, but I just want to um, briefly go through then some definitions or concepts related to neutralization because this is the central part of my research. So when we say neutralization, basically we are talking about international status where stakeholder countries can grant neutrality to countries, territories, and even waterways. And here, what I mean by stakeholder countries, they are usually major powers who have staked important geopolitical interests and sometimes also geoeconomic interests in particular hotspots and to redress their differences among their interests or to preserve certain parts of the world so that, to, so that you can avoid unnecessary conflicts, these stakeholder countries can select neutrality as an option. Now, once you are neutralized, neutralized countries are expected to shoulder some burdens and they include ability to, to, ability to defend your territorial integrity through self-defense, and their successful neutralization are meant to contribute to regional stability. As for specific conditions for neutralization, they are divided into largely subjective and objective conditions. Subjective encompass things such as countries' leaders and people's support for neutralization and domestic and international rights and duties that these neutralized countries need to adhere to. And then there is objective condition where the country's geographical position will determine whether that particular country is eligible for neutralization. Now, Many of you may think that neutralization is, not, is a, a rather obscure concept, but if you look back into history of intense relations, there have been quite a number of cases where uh, these stakeholder countries decided to grant certain uh, countries or territories as neutralized parts. And there are many examples, but one of the some of the common examples include Belgium and Switzerland. And coincidentally, Korean neutralization is closely resembled to Belgium and Switzerland because if you follow through past um, neutralization proposals adopted by both within and outside Korea, countries that, mention, that are mentioned most frequently uh, Belgium and Switzerland. Of course, there are other examples such as Luxembourg, Serbia, 
Netherlands, and even Bulgaria, although Bulgaria was never formally neutralized, just being a buffer state. But at the same time, you could say that neutralized Korea, if it did occur, could have served as a buffer state between continental powers such as China and maritime powers such as Japan. So moving on, when it comes to historical context surrounding Korean neutralization, we can say that Korean neutralization was um, affected by three major power, uh, rivalries. Firstly, there was Sino-Japanese rivalry from 1882 to 1895. Secondly, Anglo-Russian rivalry from 1885 to 1887. And finally, Russo-Japanese rivalry from 1895 to 1905. Now, there's a reason why I chose these three periods. And, for, and the reason being why, for example, Sino-Japanese rivalry started in 1882 and ended 1895 is, in 1882, there was political incident in South, in the Korean Peninsula, Imo coup. And through that coup, China was able to maximize its political influence on the Korean Peninsula, even to an extent uh, stationing its troops and sending its representative Yuan Shikai there. And although Chinese troops withdrew after Tianjin Convention in 1884 with Japan, until China's defeat in the Sino-Japanese War in 1895, China was regarded both Korean and external observers as a country that had most influence over Korean affairs. Now, why Anglo-Russian rivalry? Well, although it only lasted around two years when Britain occupied Gomundo or Port Hamilton in English in 1885, this rivalry was very important because those of you who are familiar with the concept, the great game, at that time, Britain and Russia was competing for regional supremacy, including in Asia. And as a global hegemon, Britain regarded Russia as, as its chief rival in Asia. And although Afghanistan has received a lot of attention from the scholars, Korea too was also the center of attention. And the reason why Britain, for example, occupied Port Hamilton was to preserve both its strategic and commercial interests in the region by occupying this key island and to use this island to guard Russian expansion. And I would also note that it was during this period when Britain occupied Port Hamilton that there was the greatest chance to realize Korean neutralization, which was actually suggested by British Foreign Secretary, which I will mention later. And then from 1895 to 1905, around 10 years, although Japan briefly emerged as supreme power on the Korean Peninsula, Japanese power on the region was curtailed by so-called triple intervention, which was led by Britain, uh, sorry, France, Germany, and Russia, which was designed to stop Japanese expansion on the continent to Asia. So from 1895 to 1905, when Russia lost in the Russo-Japanese war, for around 10 years, Compared to, say, Sino Japanese rivalry, as US Minister to Korea Horace New Newton Ireland observed at that time, there was no clear hegemon on the Korean Peninsula on the horizon. So, this meant then that both Koreans and non Koreans were able to put forward various neutralization proposals to either preserve their strategic interests 
or preserve some sort of stability in the region or from the Korean perspective to preserve its fragile independence from the possible war between Japan and Russia. And all throughout this period, Korea was a periphery in the international system, which was led by core powers such as Britain, France, Russia, and the late imperial power, Japan. So as a weak power, neutralization was perhaps the only option worthwhile for Korean policymakers to consider at that time. So there were numerous factors aside from major power rivalries affecting Korean neutralization. And here I'm just introducing some of the major ones. Firstly, there was international agreements. And international agreements such as Weber, Comoran, and Random allowed both hegemony powers such as Japan and Russia, but also even Korea, to use this breeding space to engage in more autonomous foreign policy, including neutralization policy. Excuse me. And uh, secondly, there is a political factions such as pro-China, Japan, Russia, and neutralization. So during this period, the Korean court was divided into different factions. And these factions, aside from neutralization, worked closely with major powers, such as Japan and Russia, or, or Joseon Korea's perhaps oldest uh, ally, China. Now, pro-neutralization faction was the newest political faction. And this faction compared to, say, pro-China, Japan, and Russia was free from the major power influence. And they deliberately chose not to rely on specific power. Although from time to time, they may look to certain powers such as France, Britain, and even Russia, because they realized that in order to achieve neutralization, they re needed major power support. Thirdly, there was concessions such as railroads. And this was a time when not just Korea, but many um, periphery or semi-periphery states decided to dole out concessions to major powers. And their justification was that if you have more major power intervention or interest on your country, chances are you can play off those powers to preserve your autonomy or independence. So by the same token, the Korean court led by Emperor Gojong at that time, decided to um, allocate certain concessions, including railroads such as Gyeonggi Railroad, Gyeongin Railroad, Gyeongwon and Gyeongbu Railroads, all of which connected the Korean Peninsula to either key ports such as Busan or to border towns such as Gyeonghung, which bordered Russia. Then there were loans that the Korean court had to tap. And one of the famous loans that it tried to engineer was so-called Unnam Syndicate. And this Unnam syndicate was particularly important because this loan, unlike other loan attempts from say China, Japan, because this was brought by French um, financiers and because France was considered a major part with no obvious interest in Korean territory, Gojo and his aides, especially those in pro-neutralization faction thought that they can use loans like Unnam to use such loans both to strengthen Korean economy and military, but also to invite France to maintain its interests on the Korean Peninsula, which they hoped by turn, when say crisis occurs, France could perhaps exercise so-called good offices or intervene in Korea's behalf. And finally, don't, I would also point out the role of telegraph lines. And much like railroads, these telegraph lines were connected to 
either ports or towns that would then travel to continental Asia. And these telegraph lines were very important because timely communication of di diplomatic messages were vital for Korean court to relay and receive sensitive messages to major powers. Of course, because this was a period of imperial intrusion, there was no guarantee that even secure telegraph lines would work for Korea. Because in the beginning from China and later Japan, these hostile powers, although to be fair, China was regarded as more friendly power being a suzerain, although it's, I have to say that as we can see from the records, even erstwhile pro-China faction members and even Gojong decided to reduce Korea's dependence on China because they observed how China switched from traditional role of benign surgery to more like um, a new type of imperial power, which European power seemed to uh, resemble. And certainly Qing, there is evidence to suggest that Qing China's role in Kojong Korea was different from say pre Kojong era. Now, moving on to Korean neutralization proposals. As I said earlier, there were attempts from both within and outside Korea. Specifically, there were neutralization proponents from eight countries, and they included China, Japan, Korea, Britain, France, Germany, Russia, and the United States. And many of these proponents were either policymakers uh, intellectuals or and even newspapers from say Japan and in fact the first attempt to neutralize Korea originated from Japanese newspaper called Yubin Hochi Shimbun not by Korean proponent although later on Korean proponents also suggested um, various initiatives to neutralize their country However, like I said earlier regarding the Port Hamilton incident, the most likelihood that Korea would have realized its neutralization was that suggested by British. And this particular proposal was suggested by Earl of Rosebery. And the photo right on his side is the photo of the British Foreign Secretary, Earl of Rosebery at the time. And he put forward this proposal on 14th of April, 1886, amidst Britain's occupation of Port Hamilton, primarily to secure Britain's position in East Asia. Now going a bit deeper in this neutralization proposal, Komondo, as I said earlier, was strategically important for Britain. In fact, Britain's first sea lord, Earl of Northbrook, commented at the time, Gomondo was basically a base for the blockade of the Russian forces in the Pacific and Port Hamilton was, according to in his own words, advantageously situated for the command of the Korean channel. So as you can see that Britain occupied Port Hamilton ostensibly to guard Russian expansion, but clearly there was a reason why Britain engaged in this preemptive action to preserve its strategic interests rather than um, stop this alleged Russian expansion on the Korean Peninsula. Now, Rosebear's scheme was because that Russia was seen as a chief rival in Asia, was to counter the country's sudden expansion in its own mind. And it did benefit from two things. Firstly, as reported by the British newspaper, The Times at the time, Li Hongzhang, the Chinese official in charge of Korean policy at the time, actually suggested something similar along the line of neutralization, which is joint protection of Korea by Britain, China, and Japan. And because 
joint protection of Korea can then lead to neutralization in the later stage. You could say Roseberry's proposal could have received China's backing. And his foreign office colleague, James Bryce, who was serving as under foreign secretary at the time, testified at the parliament at the time that the laws of Korea would be equivalent for Britain as if losing Belgium, which was already neutralized European country and whose neutralization was supported by major powers such as Britain. Of course, as history demonstrated, Earl Roseberry's proposal failed because despite his mediation, no major powers, including that of China, refu China refused to accept his proposal. However, it is still worthwhile to consider the possible scenario if his proposal actually succeeded. So what if then his proposal succeeded? I argue that Roseberry's proposal could have preserved balance of power in the Far East. It would have given more time for Joseon Korea to engage in self-threatening self movement because without um, stable foreign policy, it was very difficult for periphery states like Joseon Korea to engage in wholesale domestic reforms because if you're um, national security is not secured. It's very difficult for any state, let alone big state like Joseon Korea at the time to engage, or should I say to focus on domestic reforms. And as James Bryce remarked, Joseon Korea could have become the Belgium or Far East, where it could act as um, stabilizing equilibrium among major powers that help avoid a regional war, which as you know, did break out later with Sino-Japanese war and Russo-Japanese war. So, neutralization in the end failed. And although there were attempts to neutralize Korea up even after Earl Roseberry's very timely and well thought of proposal, None of them actually had um, measure of success, if, even if it was possible compared to Earl Roseberry's proposal. Of course, this does not mean that Korean court or those interested in Korean neutralization gave up such prospect. In fact, on January 21st, 1904, as the cloud for Rus as the Russo-Japanese war was drawing closer, the Korean court worked with French charge d'affaire, Vicomte de Fontenay, who actually helped the Korean court to um, draft a wartime neutrality declaration alongside blessing, his, a blessing from Russian minister to Korea at the time, uh, Pavlov. The Korean court was able to use uh, telegraph office in China, uh, which actually uh, acted as external communication office for Korean court at the time, because Korean court could not rely safely on its own telegraph lines within Korea because it was under heavy surveillance from Japan. But despite all the odds, Korean court was able to declare its wartime neutrality on this date, January 1st, January 21st, 1904. And eventually, um, Russia did support for Korean wartime neutrality, was, which was very crucial because as, you can, as can be seen from Russian official documents, the Russian court thought neutralized Korea would help not just regional stability, but also allow Korea to maintain its independence from Japan. And you can see why the justification for Fontenay's involvement 
in French diplomatic document. And he specifically mentions that he thought neutralized Korea, albeit war, even during wartime, would have preserved some measure of balance of power in the region. Now, of course, Russia did lose from the Russo Japanese War, and this meant that thanks to the Treaty of Portsmouth, which United States mediated, this meant that after the treaty, Japan effectively gained international support for its predominance on over Korea. And Japan was also blessed by a renewal of Anglo-Japanese alliance in 1905, which specifically mentioned, unlike the first Anglo-Japanese alliance in 1901, that basically Japan was given go ahead to make Korea a protector state. And although Russia refused to accept that Korea lost its independence, even after the Treaty of Portsmouth, in fact, Russia even uh, invited Korea to attend the Second Hague Peace Conference, which was held at Hague in 1907 to discuss arms control and other major strategic um, issues. And the Korean court uh, felt encouraged and decided to send three envoys, Lee Wee-jung, Lee sang and Lee Jun, to the Hague to sue for major power support for permanent neutrality of Korea by early 1907. It was evident that there was no major power left to support Korea's neutrality, including that of France and Russia. In fact, before the Second Hague Peace Conference was held, both France and Russia decided to abandon any support for Korean neutralization and enact their own separate agreements with Japan so that Japan, Russia, and France can secure their own respective colonial interests in Asia. So unfortunately, these three envoys were, una un even were unable to attend this conference and had to use international media outlets such as New York Times to air their case for Korean neutralization. And because there was no international consensus, their proposals failed. In fact, it's safe to say that apart from lack of international consensus, political instability and weak military strengths of Korea state at that time meant that there was no hope for Korean neutralization, except during the Port Hamilton incident when the reigning hegemon Britain could have helped Korea to become a neutral state. And Belgium's case was specifically that because unlike Switzerland, which successfully obtained its neutralization at Congress of Vienna in 1815, Belgium's neutralization was actually a byproduct of major powers agreement. So irrespective of Belgium's own will or even its military strength, which to be fair, it did acquire later on, Belgium's neutralization was made possible because stakeholder countries agreed to do so. So, as I said, Korean neutralization failed, but why is this concept still relevant? As you know, in the last few years, we have now entered a new era in international relations, that is Sino-US bipolarity. And as Norwegian scholar, Owen, uh, Torin Owen Stein, American um, opinion maker Farid Zakaria, and other scholars who now say clearly that we have, we now have two basically superpowers, China and United States ruling the, um, as uh, maintaining, as actually most strongest voice on international relations, it gives an opportunity for geographically and strategically located countries like South Korea, which has now become middle power because 
unlike, say, Joseon Korea, which clearly was too weak to maintain its independence, South Korea today is 10th largest economic power by GDP nominal terms. And according to international uh, rankings, such as that provided by Global Firepower Index, South Korea's military strength is now considered something along the line of six or seventh most powerful. So while South Korea is not strong enough to invade say major powers like China, Russia, Japan, and of course the US is ally now, it is strong enough to maintain its independence. And a successfully neutralized Korean peninsula can compensate its past weakness of geopolitics and use its newly gained status to exploit geoeconomics, as you can see from the map. And the reality of the Korean companies engaging in multilateral trade with an investment in erstwhile enemies such as China and Russia, and even its difficult uh, neighbor, Japan, we can see clearly that um, due to very close supply network and South Korea's newly gained status as a respectable middle power, it is now in position to use, um, if possible, newly gained status, i.e. neutralization to exert its influence on the global stage. Now, even with this explanation, you may remain quite skeptical whether neutralization has any value. You may think it's just a pipe dream. However, recently a number of opinion makers have stepped forward and suggested neutralization. So for instance, in 2017, amidst um, nuclear crisis surrounding North Korea, former British Foreign Office diplomat and the then uh, Chinese China Studies Scholar at Harvard, Roderick McFarquhar, suggested neutralized Korean Peninsula as an option to gain China's support for denuclearization and ultimately reunification of Korea. A year later, former Singaporean diplomat Kisho Makafani wondered in his book, Has the West Lost It?, which basically discusses China's rise as a new hege hegemonic power. Much like uh, McFarquhar, he suggested that neutralization should be entertained as the unification of Korea. And I would also include my own contribution for East Asia Forum. And in this op-ed piece, I suggested we could strive for a multi-step process to facilitate both denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula and ultimately permanent neutrality. Now, I'd like to end today's lecture by stre uh, stressing why permanent neutrality still makes sense, not just on the Korean Peninsula, but other strategic hotspots. In a book named Beyond NATO, uh, Michael O'Hanlon Brookings Institute scholar suggested that about three years ago in his book that because Eastern Europe has entered a new normal, which is there is no clear hegemon, in this case, Russia and NATO led United States, where no single power can exert exclusive voice on strategic hotspots in Eastern Europe. He suggested, O'Hanlon, that in his book, that we should consider permanent neutrality as a new option. And I should also mention that O'Hanlon is not the only one. For example, uh, former US Secretary of State Hillary Clinton also suggested that uh, in order to secure Afghanistan's independence, she floated the idea of permanent neutralization of Afghanistan so that neutralized Afghanistan can serve as a buffer state to secure its independence amidst major powers surrounding the country. So 
the reason why I'm mentioning both Eastern Europe and Afghanistan is, is that to show that this idea of permanent neutralization has resurfaced as policy discourse by opinion makers and scholars alike. And this gives it another reason why both Korean policymakers and those abroad, as well as scholars to seriously consider neutralization as an option. And of course, although there's no domestic consensus in Korea at this time, I think just like in the case of Belgium, it can be suggested by outside powers like China or even within South Korea, where over the years, uh, both policymakers and scholars can work together and business community too, because business community plays important role in regional economy to make a case for neutralized Korean peninsula, which not only can secure its independence, but act as a bridge between maritime powers such as Japan and the United States and continental powers such as uh, China and Russia. So my humble hope and wish is that in the years to come, perhaps scholars and policymakers can revisit the failed neutralization of Korea during Joseon and to learn from their um, mistakes so that we can avoid making same mistakes in the future. Thank you for listening and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Jin. That was a, a very brief summary of the very rich manuscript that I, I know that you're working on. Uh, so I'm, 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 I'm sure through the discussions we will be able to get much more out of what you've been doing and looking into this question. So please, if I, I could ask if you have any questions, any comments, anything, if you could please put that in the Q&A box. Uh, and then I, as, as chair, will, will forward those questions to uh, Dr. Jin. Uh, so as you're doing that uh, and to get some discussion going, uh, I will start by, by asking a few questions. Uh, and, and for you, Dr. Jin, this will probably bring about deja vu things, kind of things that we discussed when, when, you, when you worked on your, uh, on your dissertation. Uh, so uh, I, I think for, for many people, it, it might be those kind of novel things that, that you're talking about. We, haven't, we don't really read about neutralization for, for Korea in this period. And of course, that is because in the end, it never materialized. Uh, so I, I think, and I, I said that before when you're working on your PhD, uh, that, that yeah, you have a good point in, in saying, well, it never happened, but still we, we, we can learn things by looking into these efforts. Uh, what were the motivations uh, uh, that these various actors had when, when they proposed uh, for this to happen? Uh, in the end, the, the kind of angle that you have in this talk now is okay so the, the, the significance what we can learn from this or what, what uh, insights we, we, we can get from this is something that we can apply to to contemporary times uh, but I, I would like to go back I and mean, I, I consider your work to be a work of, of history in a sense, so yeah, it never happened. It never really materialized in, in Korea, but, but still looking into these efforts, what can that tell us? How can that contribute to the study of, of neutralization in that time period? So like the 19th into the early 20th century. So, so what, what could your work contribute uh, in, in that sense? Uh, it would be interesting to hear. So, 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 what, what can it add by, by looking into the into the Korean case? Uh, another thing, and of course, this is all speculative, but you engage in a little bit speculation yourself, in sense of saying what could have happened if, when we did have the, the occupation of Port Hamilton, if that came about. Uh, 
So uh, what, what do you think was lacking? So, so in the end, why did not that happen? So, so you, you, you bring out there was, could have been a lot of kind of positive results or, or consequences uh, of that. So uh, well, once again, yeah, that, that would have to be speculative, I, I guess, in a sense, but, but why, what was missing? Why didn't, that, that was the closest it got in this time period. So why didn't it really happen? I mean, one of the strengths I think of, of your work uh, is the way in which you looked at materials in, in, in archives from, from a lot of, of different countries. Uh, so in, in general, just opening up maybe a little bit broader than the issue of neutralization. So, so looking into that kind of archival material, newspaper material from all of these different countries, uh, just in, in general, what was the understanding of Korea at that time? I mean, was it of concern or, or was it extremely peripheral? Or what kind of understanding did, did, did people have of, of Korea? I think that could be interesting to hear as well. So I, I see that question starts to pop into the Q&A. So I'll stop there. And if, if you could just say a few words on that, and then we'll get to the questions in the Q&A box. Yeah, so thank you, Dr. Kazun, for your very kind comments. I suppose by looking at uh, multilingual archives, which you said I did consult, and personal documents as well. My overall impression was that although by varying degrees, but many of them were largely um, either ignorant or overlooked Korea's importance as a geopolitical puzzle. So although there were exceptions, for example, by the likes of um, William Franklin Sands, who was an American advisor to Kojong, and if you look at his personal documents, which are current, um, it's clear to see that unlike other Westerners who are very critical of Kojong's leadership, he thinks that Kojong did his best to preserve Korean independence. And his documents also testify the, product, the barriers that prevented Korean state to engage in new challenging diplomacy, including um, Japanese tempering of Korean telegraph lines. Now, you can also look at uh, Japanese documents on Emil uh, Bonasson, who was a um, French legal advisor to Japanese court. And Bonasson also, by the way, suggested Korean neutralization. And to his credit, I think he did possess a nuanced picture of Korean Peninsula and since as important component in regional stability. So that kind of answers your second part. And what can we learn from looking at the past um, the Korean neutralization proposals for um, contemporary history at the time? I think, well, I mean, although my research did, does focus on neutralization because it also covers major power rivalry surrounding it, as well as influencing factors such as in international agreements and loans and railroads, etc. So even if let's say you have no interest whatsoever on Korea or even East Asia, you can still use Korean um, case studies, for example, Korean attempts to make loans or railroad this concession diplomacy with major powers with that of say Egypt. So for example, those of you who are familiar with uh, Egypt's history in the late 19th century, kind of like similar to Korea at the time, Egypt was nominally independent, but under the Ottoman Empire's, um, uh, okay, let me rephrase it. So Ottoman Empire was nominally its suzerain, just like a Qing China at the time, but in reality was much more complicated because by the late 19th century, you have imperial powers like Britain and France moving in to Egypt and their domination initially started with making loans to Egypt. And of course, the now famous Suez Canal was a creation of French and Frenchmen. And although this was built by the the French um, technical know-how. That's where the name, the Suez 
Suez French Consortium Company came from Suez Canal. It was the British court, British Prime Minister Disraeli at the time who decided to uh, invest substantial portions of money to buy some stakes in the strategic assets. So, you, so that can serve as a useful case study, how comparing Egypt and Korea. And I think going back to the Rosebrae proposal, in the interest of time, I did not go deeper, but the reason why it failed is that, first of all, no major powers were interested. So China, despite being approached twice by Rosebrae, refused to respond uh, favorably. So because China at the time was negotiating with Russia to, um, so in return for Britain's withdrawal from Komondo or Port Hamilton, the idea was that Russia would not covet Korean territory and China will act as some kind of guarantor to make sure that the Russian expansion on the Korean Peninsula would not happen. So China's interest was more into preserving its sovereignty over Korea and strike a separate deal with Russia rather than working with Britain to bring the Korean Peninsula a neutralized place. I think it should have happened, but I suppose this is another case, classic case of where um, major powers interests collide. And that unfortunately that failure overlooked this real possibility that Korean Peninsula could have neutralized and hopefully uh, preserved regional stability. But as you say, it's, it's all speculation. Nothing is guaranteed, but I think it's useful for historians to consider not just strictly the past cases and just assess from it, but imagine the what if scenarios, because I think, because I stated earlier that my research is still relevant. I think to this day, it is important. So even more so that we engage in more some creative thinking where instead of just looking at the historical events as, as, as it is, but imagine what was the geopolitical complexities that led to such conclusion. Yeah, that's, that's where I put it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, now I, I will forward the, the questions from the Q&A box. And the first question is from Veronica, Veronica Bergstoller. Uh, and the question is, uh, how did neutralization proposals by Japan initially fit into its strategic interest in the region and imperial ambitions? So initially, the reason why I put on for the likes of Yubin, Yubin Ho Chi Shinbun suggesting neutralization was that they, Japan realized that compared to China, its strategic presence on the Korean Peninsula was weak. So in order to weaken China's influence over Korean Peninsula and by extension the region, that's why Japan suggests neutralization. So it is not the, it is not the case for example, that Japan as early as 1880s were confident that they can colonize uh, Korea because as I just said, until China's defeat, it was pretty much in agreement that China was the, uh, how do I say, hegemon in the East Asia, among the East Asian powers. Although the recent scholarship has shown that after 1880s, China was losing its primacy to Japan, but people were not certain. It took the war to finally confirm that, okay, Japan is the new Asian power. So until then, China was regarded as strongest power in Asia. So Japan too had no option but to try something different. And that's when neutralization came along. Okay, <coughs> thank you. Uh, I hope that answered your question, Veronica. And the next question from Zachary Matuszewski. Uh, and this is a question about the concessions that you mentioned at the beginning. So uh, first, this is an important project. Your concluding remarks make me think about the role of imperial exploitation, the role that plays in your argument. Uh, you mentioned concessions as a way for Korea to play the imperial powers. But isn't there an aspect of concessions that implies or runs on exploitation? Uh, in that way, if any was 
Korea's sovereignty compromised in the neutral position? Yes, thank you for your question. And you're right that, of course, there's an element of exploitation. And, but realistically, at the time, Joseon Korea was too weak to develop on its own. It still needed external assistance. In fact, even Meiji Japan um, had to spend some years to engage in some wholesale self strengthening to end, for example, unfair, unequal treaties with Western powers. So if even Japan had to undergo that process, you can imagine how even Joseon Korea had no choice but to engage in external, uh, accept external assistance. So of course they knew that if they just dole out those concessions and wait for West major powers intervention, then well, yes, you will be exploited. So as a compromise solution was that in the meantime, they were, look to various Western powers. So I mentioned railroad concessions, for example, these strategic concessions, concessions were not just given to one power. So for example, one, uh, one railroad would be given to France, a French interest, another one to Japan, another one to Russia. In the meantime, by the early 1900s, especially the Korean war court itself was trying to figure out a way to develop this railroad domestically, but it was simply very difficult because Korean economy was very weak. So I think you have to, sometimes you have to work with what you got and sometimes your option is un, unattractive, but sometimes that's, that is the only way, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, we, it is an anonymous question uh, yeah. and it brings us back to contemporary time. And the question is, uh, what is the popular thought surrounding neutralization of uh, neutralization in Korea at the moment? Well, I think I mentioned towards the end of my lecture that there is no domestic con clear domestic consensus even within Korea. So popular opinion is that unfortunately, in my view, just look to America as primary partner. Of course, like people recognize that whether we like it or not, China is the most important market for South Korean goods. So there's a realization that we need to maintain good relationship with China, but neutralization is not considered a attractive option for, for many. However, about two years ago, I had an opportunity to visit South Korea's Ministry of Foreign Affairs to attend their seminar. And the speaker, uh, Professor Park Tae-gyun at Seoul Nash University, he discussed the possibility of neutralization of Korea by looking at neutralization proposal proposed by President Dwight Eisenhower during the Korean War. And the reason why he mentioned that is to show that it is simply not true that neutralization is just a, is a Korean phenomenon. That you can, and he, he specifically mentioned this to show that even the Americans if they, if they think it was beneficial, entertained option of neutralization. And judging from the reaction of diplomats, I think it was quite, it didn't go down very well because not surprisingly, because many of them are schooled in pro US mindset. And I don't know how, I don't know. And of course, like majority of US, uh, South Korean scholars are pro US and the media as well. But I think there comes a time in history, including Korean history, where very minority opinion can change history. I don't know if you're familiar with this um, Korean diplomat named Sohee. And in early 11th century Korea, it was Korea at the time, was invaded by uh, uh, Liao. And the Liao army, uh, which was led by the Sosonyo, I don't know what the Chinese pronunciation, I can't remember Chinese pronunciation, but his name was Sosonyo in Korean. And both him and Sohi sat down together and then Sohi convinced him that if you withdraw your army and if you um, allow us basically to use cont to contemporary jargon to maintain strategic autonomy between Liao and Song, we will not take side with Song, which was the uh, ultimate rival of Liao. And Liao general, So Sun accepted that. And although there was another war followed between Liao and Korea, 
because Korea was militarily strong enough to defend itself, just like South Korea would argue now, Korea was able to maintain what in 21st century term known as neutral diplomacy. So, and the reason why I mentioned Seoul is that even, even during at that time, the Korea court, Seoul was the, probably the only one, as far as I know, that uh, convinced the Korea king at the time with, that to negotiate rather than surrender to Liao's demands. And that small decision changed history, not just for the Korean history, but Northeast Asian history as a whole, because autonomous or independent Korea between Song and Liao meant that there was a balance of power in the region. So I, I hope that answers your question, that my hope, and I'm not, a, I'm not optimistic that it will be taken up anytime soon, but maybe in the longer term, um, more and more voices within South Korea will say that, yeah, let's consider this as an option. In fact, the late president Kim Dae-jung, after he stepped down, he gave a lecture and he said, he said the ultimate goal for South Korea's foreign policy should be to maintain neutral posture among four major powers, China, Japan, Russia, and the United States. So Kim Dae-jung was regarded Kim Jong diplomacy was well respected, even in the eyes of Michael Green, who is a conservative uh, US scholar based at CS Center for CSIS in Washington, DC. So again, I stress to you that uh, it may not be popular now, but we cannot rule out what will happen, let's say 20 years or 30 years time. So again, it's a speculation, but that's just my view. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think you've made your view quite clear and maybe you can produce more co-eds and, and, and things uh, to that effect. And next, it's a question from Alexandra Leoncini. So did the neutrality discourses prevalent in the late 19th, early 20th centuries influence similar discourses in Korea following liberation? I seem to recall that there were student voices calling for neutralization in 1961 as well? Uh, to tell you the truth, because my research focus on late 19th to early 20th century, so I'm less familiar with the post-liberation period. But my sense is, is that it may have, because the first president of South Korea, Lee Seung man his PhD dissertation at Princeton was basically achieving Korea's permanent neutrality by relying on the United States. Of course, his dissertation is different from mine because mine is like a, focuses on not just America, but also uh, Korea's ties with China, Russia, Britain, Japan, etc. So it looks into more holistic picture, whereas Lee Seung mans idea was rely on the America to achieve neutrality. And the more important thing is that after he became president, he never entertained the option of neutralization. So I think it may had it may have had an impact, but I don't think it had a huge impact, to be honest. But I may be mistaken. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I hope that answered your question, Alexandra. Uh, then Hugo Ingmarsson, uh, how do you position yourself to the problem of historicism? as the societal and political structures of 19th century have changed to this day. Then very interesting talk all in all. Yes. How so, do you position yourself to the problem of historicism? Historicism, yes. Um, it is something that I will have to uh, constantly think about when I engage in historical speculation of like what if it has succeeded and why it failed, etc. But I think to me, history is a conversation between past and present. So yes, as Mark Twain said, history does not repeat itself, but it does rhyme after all, that's what he said, right? So I'm not advocating any way that, okay, let's just look at what happened in 1907 or 1886 and say, okay, this is what happened. We can cut and paste and then we can try again. No, it's, I'm not just saying that, but because South Korea, unlike Joseon Korea, is much stronger position, economically, militarily, and technologically. And one thing that I think really makes the current South Korea more advantageous is that South Korean companies are investing in both in China and Russia, the erstwhile Cold War enemies. 
I mean, you could argue that Korea's relation with China and Russia is not that friendly. However, if you compare with, let's say, Korea's relations with China and Russia or Soviet Union back in 1950s and 60s, clearly, I think even most conservative anti-China, anti-Russia forces would not dare to say we should cut off ties with China and Russia or just forget and just, just rely entirely with our relationship with America. So because circumstances have changed in some ways advantageously, but at the same time, the reason why I'm pushing for Korean neutralization nevertheless is there is this um, geopolitical weakness that still hover around the Korean Peninsula because it still is weaker than four major powers. But because but luckily, Korea is stronger to defend itself. And I would argue that maybe for my future update that Korea, neutralized Korea can become like Finland of East Asia. So just like Finland managed to remain pro-Western buffer state between Soviet Union and the United States, maybe uh, Korean future uh, unified Korea can assume similar role. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, and next, it, it's a question from G. Leslie, and it has to do with uh, what, what, what kind of, of powers would such an agreement of neutrality have? So the question is, as Belgium's neutrality was set aside in the First World War by Germany, uh, and it is alleged that Germany considered to occupy Switzerland in, in the Second World War, uh, how can one be sure that any neutrality held by Korea uh, would only last for as long as was convenient to the powers. Uh, if Korea had been neutral in the Second World War, can we be sure Japan would not have invaded? So yeah, well, what kind of guarantee would, would such an agreement have brought? Yeah, that's an excellent point. And you're right that Belgian neutrality was violated eventually, but please don't forget that um, almost for almost like 90 odd years or so, from 1830 to 1914. Uh, okay, that's about like 70 or 80 years, 80 years. But whilst Korea during that period lost its independence totally, Belgium still able to maintain its independence. And yes, although it was invaded again, like someone mentioned historicism, you, can, uh, you cannot assume that because Belgium failed at that time that future, uh, neutralized Korea would have also been invaded because each region is different. And there's no reason to believe that because uh, Belgium was invaded by Germany, therefore Japan would have surely invaded Korea during World War II. Again, it's speculation, but I think one of the mistakes for many scholars that make is that Many use European examples and think that it's automatically apply for Asian examples. Although I'm also guilty as charged because I use European examples, but what I try to do in my study is to reapply European examples and then combine them with the conditions on the ground or person Korea. So please feel free to disagree with me, but I think history I think history is a, and international relations is about measuring failure, but also um, speculating the possibility. Instead of just resigning uh, to ourselves and think, okay, well, it's not going to succeed. It failed or it will fail anyway. So we just keep, not just try anything and just stick to the same formula, which I think does not work or did not work at the time or and in many, instances in the past. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. It is an, an important point being raised. I mean, it's, uh, this agreement comes out of some kind of balance of power. Of course, those constantly change. Uh, so so there, there seems to be difficult to have some kind of permanent agreement solution. Uh, and uh, for the moment, this is the last question, maybe. Please, if you have any questions or comments, please do put that in the Q&A. But for the moment, the last one, once again, anonymous. Uh, the question is, would a neutral South Korea be guaranteed a safe existence from a North Korea uh, 
with sometimes inherently unstable leaders. Yes, uh, I'm glad that you mentioned North Korea. Of course, uh, I think everybody in this room, I would hope, has no love for the current regime or its leadership. However, I'll put it to you this way. If you look into uh, past diplomatic documents and the studies surrounding North Korea, it's simply not true that uh, North Korean leaders are just crazy people who just like to launch missiles and engage in prov provocative attacks. I'm not saying they didn't, but just like all national leaders, they too have their own strategic intents why they engage such behaviors. And one reason is that they, are, they feel very insecure about their survival. And this is what, and that reason, and, and another end, of course, like, um, because the memory of colonialism is very alive. Another reason why they decided to develop nuclear missile is to maintain strategic autonomy, even from its allied China. But I would also point out that in 19, early 1990s, as the cold, as Iron Curtain was tearing down and Cold War was ending in Europe and elsewhere, the North Korea actually approached the United States and asked for diplomatic recognition. Washington at that time turned it down. And now that to me, I think was costly mistake because if let's say uh, China and Soviet Union recognize South Korea, which they did eventually, and vice versa with Japan and United States also recognizing North Korea, I think we could have not entirely solved, but done a profound way, in my view, to mitigate North Korea's constant fear about security threats. Because even though they may have nuclear weapon or missiles now, but they know all too well the conventional military and economy is still too weak. And there are two ways to bring out regime change in North Korea, which I think you may have alluded because you say the regime is unstable. But Sometimes you have to, again, work with what you have. It is simply unrealistic to assume that North Korean state will collapse with more sanctions, more pressure, because uh, the past decades have shown it is, is simply is not the case. And as Nixon, the Cold War warrior, went to Beijing and struck a deal with Mao, whose ideology was very different from Nixon's. And speaking of human rights, I think we can all agree that Mao's human rights record was not particularly fantastic either. But Nixon still had enough strategic foresight to go to China and improve relations with China to counter Russia and to, and to, and to, and to create new strategic equilibrium. So I would argue that from the Washington's perspective, and this is something that um, Rodetic McFarquhar and others also argue is that because China too has legitimate interests uh, on, on the fear of neutralized of uh, uh, this unstable North Korea or the sudden collapse of North Korea, in which in my view is not any, it's not going to come anytime soon, but even if it does happen, it's simply wishful thinking to assume that it, given the current tension between China and the US that China will just tolerate unified Korean Peninsula with US military in presence. It's, it's just not going to happen. Imagine uh, China stationing troops in Mexico. Uh, and do you think the Americans will tolerate that? Of course not. You just have, and even look at the Cuba, Cuba missile crisis. Again, the United States did not step, sit still when Soviet decided to deploy nuclear weapons there. So I would argue that instead of just demonizing North Korea and picturing country as black and white terms, sometimes you have to engage in pragmatic pragmatism and to bring about the change in more gradual order you face. That would be my answer. Thank you. Uh, we've, we've had one more question, oh, one more coming in. And this is actually, you're extending into what, what you've been discussing. Uh, and this is from Chao Xin Bang. So uh, just like Qing China was not willing to concede its power to neutralize Korea 
back in that time, uh, how can the US concede its power to allow South Korean neutralization? That's a very good question, but another, um, again, it's not going to happen in immediate future, but I'm sure I assume you're Chinese and in numerous recent studies, not just um, from Britain and Japan and Russia show that by the late 2020s, even by nominal terms, because already purchasing power terms, US Chinese economy is actually larger than the US economy. So in the late 2020s, it is forecast that China will overtake the United States as biggest economy power. And if you look at from history, it after United States overtook Britain as largest economy, eventually um, uh, Britain, whether we liked it or not, had to cede its hegemony to US. Of course, there were, there were two world wars, but my point is that once you become the strongest economic power, it is likely that you will have to cede your hegemony to another power. Now, in my view, another reason why I think neutralization is more feasible is that um, Although I do mention now we are in the period of standard US bipolarity, however, we are, we are also witnessing the rise of India and Indonesia too. So it's, it's not just about two boys in the big, two big boys on the block. We also have other major powers. And don't forget other, the role of middle powers such as uh, Vietnam and South Korea. So my point is just like in the Northeast Asia in the 11th century, geopolitical scene is much more diverse, which means that no single power, including the United States, cannot just unilaterally assume that it will have its way. I mean, the fact that uh, US decided to have Indo-Pacific strategy to shows that it knows that it cannot work on its own to counter China's rise. In fact, Victor Cha, who had the pleasure to who I had pleasure to listen to in, uh, couple, last week in the uh, conference, he mentioned too that even no country, including the United States, is able to challenge China on its own. So that, that would be my answer to you that uh, whether we like it or not, US will have to compromise. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've had a contribution now from, from John Lee uh, and it's, a comment and a, a question. Uh, so first, so thank you, Sangpe, for the interesting presentation. Two points. First, uh, regarding the previous question, regarding the post-liberation period, uh, James chong Su Lee has argued that Soviet policy in 1945 to 1948 uh, may have been open to a neutral, unified Korea uh, along the post-Cold War Finland and Austria model so indeed, there must be wider applicability for the post-liberation era. Comment and then the question. Number two, is I'm, I'm wondering how you situate the interests of Korean local elites in the late 19th and early 20th century, and whether there was any possibility of a concerted neutralization policy with widespread support of the local elite throughout Korea in the era. Uh, particular in light of Yumi Moon's interesting arguments regarding the populist outlook of the Ilchin. Uh, yeah, thank you, John. Uh, well, I, I actually never expected that you would attend my lecture. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, very good comments and questions. Yes, it is true that I agree with uh, Professor Moon Yumi that there was no, there was, there were elements of collaboration, whether voluntary or not even among Korean elite. So the reason why I described earlier that there were different factions, pro-China, pro-Russia, pro-Japan, and perhaps the weakest pro neutralization is to show that there was no uh, internal consensus, even among Korean elites at that time. But then again, uh, ultimately Korean neutralization failed because Korea was simply too weak, but then Korea was able to manage similar feet, even though at that time too, there was no clear consensus about um, Korea's policy towards Liao and Song. But the leader at the, but to his credit, the Korea king at that time, Song Jong, agreed to dispatch 
Turkey, even though his voice represented the very small minority of Korean court at the time. But that fateful decision made a change history. So um, I fully subscribe to the notion that Korean neutralization, except for the Earl of Rosemary's proposal that it was perhaps destined to fail at that time. However, uh, there's no reason to think that, again, that one should just adopt pessimistic tone and just dismiss any attempt, however divided it was among Korean elites to have neutralization. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And uh, that was now the last question in the Q&A box. It's 20 past six. So uh, thank you. Dr. Jin, for a very interesting talk. Uh, oops, sorry. I'll have to thank you again. We do have another question coming in into the Q&A box. Uh, yes. uh, and from anonymous uh, attendant again, uh, slightly changing focus. So under what future circumstances and under what conditions could North Korea countenance a reunification? That's a very good question. And of course, the current North Korean leadership will not countenance unification at this moment. But then I don't think South Korea at least genuinely wants unification either, and nor does the South Korean public. So this denuclearization and uh, neutralization is a long-term process. That is why I refer to my op-ed piece on East Asia Forum, and I specifically mentioned in that piece that this is a multi-step process. This is not a uh, one-step one step process where you have neutralization instantly. Uh, so, so I think that at this moment, of course, they will not, they will not like it, but my hope is that over the years with more uh, processes of trust building and engagement, I think uh, North Korean leadership will be, be more comfortable with the core peaceful coexistence. And then after more some proper phases of interactions between the two Koreas and more rounds of re political and economic reconciliation, I think we can still hope peaceful unification, but not something that where North Korea just unilaterally adopts South Korean system, but something in hybrid. So of course, personally, I want unified Korea to un unify on the South Korean system, but I think we have to be realistic and assume that while the political system, I think we should still strive for plural democratic system, but economically and socially, we can compromise a bit and engage with North Korean state and its people and figure out a new way that can avoid another um, German scenario or in the worst case scenario, Yemen, and even uh, Hong Kong and China, mainland China. Yeah, so that's my uh, take on that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So then once again, thank you so much for, for an interesting talk and thank you all for listening. Uh, and uh, for all the pertinent and interesting questions and comments. It's been a very interesting uh, discussion session uh, after this. Uh, I hope you can all join us again next Friday uh, when it is Dr. Adam Bonnet who is the talker and he's going to talk about how the Chosun dynasty uh, managed uh, migrants, immigrants from, from Ming, China and in, in the, the transition between Ming and Qing. And that will be another interesting talk. So thank you so much, everyone, for, for listening. And once again, thank you, Dr. Jin. Uh, thank you very much. I hope my uh, humble attempt to um, trace neutralization uh, contribute at least modestly on diplomatic history and international relations of East Asia. And thank you once again, Dr. Carson, for your kind um, invitation and your questions too. Thank you. Thank you.